My name is Monk Rowe, and we're in New Orleans for the Jazz Education Network Conference in 2020. I'm very privileged to have Alice Marsalis with me today. Thank you for your time. I've been reading about uh, your accomplishments and your career, and uh, it seems to me that you've got a number of legacies as a performer and an educator and mentor and um, as the Marcellus family been added to the Batistas and the Humphreys and all that. So congratulations. Well, thank you. Well, good. I wanted to start off with a quote um, from a younger musician who's amongst the people that uh, you've assisted. And uh, this is the quote that he said about you only about four months ago. One of my great experiences was playing with Ellis Marcellus when I was in New Orleans and starting out. I used to do his trio gig every week at Snugs, and he would inevitably call a tune he knew you didn't know, and he'd kind of go through it rubato, kind of modern like a standard, and then he'd just go, he'd look at you and kind of laugh because he knew you didn't know it. And he'd go three, four, and you just had to hear your way through it. And that is from Neil Kane the bassist. So you were teaching on the bandstand, is that right? I think I did. I mean, I know Neil. I, I didn't really teach Neil per se. You know, he's interesting because I met him in St. Louis. He had just finished high school and he was coming to New Orleans. I think he told me to go to Tulane uh, to major in something. I don't even think it was music, but uh, he just kept the musical situation going. Uh, but th that is an example of how I learned. I played with uh, a singer who uh, had a band. His singer's name was Earl Williams. And they did a lot of standards. This was in, what, 50? something, 58, 9, around that time, or even a little earlier, because I remember I wasn't married yet. <coughs> and uh, he would call a tune, and I'd say, well, I'd say, I'm not really sure if I know that. He'd say, all right, you get it, bang, bang, and kick it off. And a lot of times, I would listen and try to hear the form of what the song was, and I'd guess at the bridge, you know. And I, if I would guess right, then I'd say, okay, then this must be where it is. <laughs> then the next time around, I would go back and do at, at the same point, just from listening. Did you have a bass player then who you could? Not on that job. Oh, well, that no, makes it not, harder. No, not really. The, the, the guy who sang had a bass, but he didn't really play. You know, he would thump along. Okay. Cause he, uh, but I didn't really have a bass player. There was a guitar player on the gig, and the drummer was Earl Palmer, who went to L.A. eventually. Uh, oh, wow. was notor notoriety. Yes. Yeah, but Earl was on that gig. <coughs> this may seem like a funny <coughs> question, but do you remember how much money you would have made on those gigs back, this was, you said, mid-50s? How much I would have made? How much, how much did you make? As I remember, we were doing six nights a week at a club called Gordon Natales, about 125, something like that. For the week? Yeah. Yeah, okay. You make more than that now, though, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just reduced the amount of time that I was <laughs> getting on the bandstand. <laughs> Can you tell me what kind of music you heard in your house growing up. You were um, 
You mean my, in the house growing up with my parents? Yes. Whatever was on the radio. Otherwise than that, you know. So they didn't... No, neither of my parents were musically inclined. Okay. Uh, they were very supportive of my sister and I as parents. But <clears throat> they were not really musically inclined. So uh, there was a radio station, uh, the call letters was WJBW. And it was the only radio station that actually played music. And it would change, I think, as I remember, during the day. Uh, little, at, as it got later in the evening, there would be different kinds of music, some orchestral types of music. I don't know that they ever actually played some symphonies, but earlier in the, in the day, they would play uh, recordings of like uh, Bing Crosby and um, maybe Louis Armstrong. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <clears throat> but it wasn't, it was sort of like the uh, Broadway pop music. Did you have a piano in the house? Not at first. Okay. We got a piano. Okay. Hold on one second. Better? Yeah. Okay. All right. So you got a piano later on? Yeah, well, my father bought this house. <clears throat> See, we were living in Orleans Parish. Most people have counties. Louisiana has parishes. And we moved from Orleans Parish to Jefferson Parish. I was about 10 years old. And eventually we got an uh, upright piano. And I would fool around with it, you know. But, uh, Later on, as we got, we meaning my sister and I, as we got closer to graduating from high school, uh, I had pretty much figured out what I wanted to do, but I didn't have a lot of understanding of how to get there. When I was in high school, I went to a concert at the Booker Washington Auditorium, and Dizzy Gillespie's big band was there. That was 1949, I think. And I, I knew when I heard that band I, that that was what I wanted to do. I mean, I had no way of knowing how to do that. But as I got a little older and I was able to, so to speak, go out on my own, you know, and meet other musicians that were local musicians, you know, musicians like Earl Palmer and other, mu other local musicians. There were a few who was really trying to learn to play jazz and some was pretty good at it already. And you, they were usually older than me. Now, there were the traditional guys who had been playing trad for a long time, like the Humphrey Brothers, Percy, uh, Percy Humphrey and his brother, and Alvin Alcorn, who had also been playing uh, trad for a while. And there was some that I had would hear about, but I never heard them play. Because see, we were all living under racial segregation. So the mobility to hear some of these guys was limited unless they were related to you. What I mean is like Alvin Alcorn played trad and he would play in white clubs or white establishment. Well, Sammy, who was his son, he would bring his son with him. 
So his son was able to learn some of that music as a result of going with his father. You know, and Albert French, who played with Oscar Celestine, his sons similar, did similar things, you know, but I was... You didn't have a father who did that? I didn't have anybody. I see. You know, it didn't even have to be a father, it just had to be somebody who could negotiate in that situation and had gigs in different places where that music was being played. So 1949, you saw Dizzy Gillespie, and the years right after that, if you wanted to hear some of these fellows you just mentioned, you, you couldn't go in the clubs where they were playing, is that right? Well, there were some clubs I went in, uh, mm -hmm. black clubs. Okay. But it was nothing like Dizzy's band. I mean, Dizzy's band <laughs> was totally different. In 1949, it was totally different. <clears throat> but I did begin to meet other musicians. And then, well, people who actually had, st had studied music. Uh, for example, at the end of the Second War, the GI Bill was introduced by the federal government. And there were guys who had been in the military and had the options. Go to college, you could do it on the GI Bill. If you want to study music, there was a school called Grunwald, where there were people who were teaching music, because that's where Earl Palmer went. And other people, some I knew, some I didn't know. Uh, but there was a fairly high level of musicianship among the popular music idiom. You know, there were guys who could really play. Uh, op the opportunities were not there beyond a certain point. But uh, if you wanted to learn, there were ways for you to get that information. Was there a distinction uh, between, in New Orleans, between jazz and popular music like R&B, or was it all sort of just one thing, and whatever the gig demanded, <coughs> that's what you should play? Well, basically, that's true. If, if uh, uh, jazz was not very popular, as a term, no, as a music, in the general sense. But the few of us who decided that we really wanted to learn, uh, like we would go to each other's house, and like if you was a piano player, you might be listening at Bud Powell, or you may be listening at um, other pianists, you know, who were playing in, in jazz groups, and go home and work on it. You know, and there were jam sessions, uh, one at a club called the Do Drop In, they'd have jam sessions on Sundays, and you could go and try out what you had learned. But for the most part, if the working musicians were all playing rhythm and blues, you know, that's what we did because that's uh, where the people were paying money for. The, the, there were shows, there was, there was the blues singers, and then there were instrumental blues type songs that we would learn because people enjoyed that. And then see another thing, people, men and women used to dance with each other during that time. So that was a lot more common. From what I can see now, dance has become a spectator sport. You go buy a ticket and watch the Beyonce and all them other people dance. I mean, unless I mean, there may be something that I'm missing because I don't I don't hang out. But as far as I know, the social dance uh, has gone the way of all things. So it was 
the band leader's job to uh, make sure that the dance floor was not empty too often. Is that right? He wanted the dance leader, the, the leader of the band wanted to see people on the dance floor and call right. those tunes that would <coughs> get them there. Yeah, all of, listen, all of those bands in the early years were built to publicity as dance bands. Stan Kenton's band was a dance band. Ellington's band was a dance band. Uh, eventually, Bass's band was a dance band because his band came out of Kansas City uh, with, the, with the Blue Devils. Uh, Rance and Tommy Darcy's band, Benny Goodman's band, was all those bands were billed as jazz bands, as dance bands. Mm -hmm. You know, because the famous 1936 concert that Benny Goodman did, you know, was at a dance. And basically that was a part of the social structure, you know, the social aspect of uh, the way people function. Males and females, that's how they function. Was, were the groups that you played with around that time, the early 50s, were they integrated? No. When was the first time that you played in an integrated band, rather than a jam session, but like a, a real gig? Oh, well, we, jam session wasn't integrated either. No kidding. <clears throat> was, there a, was there a black and a white jam session that you could go to? I mean, was there... Not in them days. <sighs> I think, I think the first band that I played with, which which could be considered an integrated band, was when I was started playing with Al Hurt, but that was in '67. Yeah. But before that, uh, no. Okay, so at that time, if you wondered what is a B flat 13 chord. Where did you go to find that information? Yeah, uh, Harold Baptiste. Okay. Harold Baptiste was a mentor for me. He was about three years older than me. He went to Dillon University and had been there maybe three years. And I went as a freshman. And he was a mentor for me in terms of saying, this is chord changes, you know, this is like C7, this is how you voice that, you know, a lot of very basic stuff. I'm, I'm glad you told me that. And uh, it's interesting that mentors don't have to be a lot older than you, right? I mean, when you're that age, three years seems like a long time, but then later on it's not. Wow. I think I saw him years ago um, at a concert. It was very, very interesting. Uh, and you had a big decision to make about the military. You ended up joining the Marine Corps. It wasn't so much a decision. You see, the, the military was still conscripting at that time. So <clears throat> when I finished from Dillard, uh, I had been playing locally with uh, Edward Blackwell, Harold Baptiste, Alvin Baptiste was a clarinet player, and Peter Bailey was a bass player, or Richard Payne, who was also a bass player. You know, there's recordings of that group available. And eventually, Edward Blackwell told me, he said, man, on that, on that Coleman, he said he's gonna send me a ticket, so I'm gonna go on back to California. You know, so I thought about it for a minute, and I said, man, you know, I just graduated from Dillard, and I was working in my father's business. He had a, the motel business, and I said, you yeah, know, I think I'd do that. You know, because I was, as they say, free, single, and disengaged. <laughs> So the two of us, we called Harold and said, hey man, 
we're getting ready to go to California, go to Los Angeles. And he said, what? He said, yeah, man. He said, hey, ain't no problem. You'll be able to get a piano player and a drummer for whatever you can do. He said, oh, no, no, no. He said, well, if y'all going, I'm going to go. <laughs> so we, got, we ended up going to Los Angeles in Harold's car. <laughs> a road trip. <laughs> you know, to Los Angeles. And uh, we stayed in a little place on East, in, in East L.A. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember much about it. It wasn't a lot. We didn't have a lot of money anyway. But eventually, Harold, I don't know that he stayed. He, no, he didn't, he didn't stay, not at that time. But I don't know when he came back because my mom tracked me down and said, well, your dad is not feeling good and you need to come home. So there was a guy I knew who had gone to school with my future wife who was coming back to New Orleans. So I hitched a ride with him. So when I got there, my dad had said, well, look, I'm doing all right. You know, if you want to go back to California, you can do that. But before I could do that, I got the greetings from everybody's favorite uncle named Sam. So I had to go take a physical. And it didn't make sense for me to go back to Los Angeles because if I'm going to be drafted, I'm going to have to come back here. You know, years later, I started thinking about exactly how similar that situation was uh, to Caesar telling all of the people to go back to where you were so that they could be taxed. But we would have to be wherever we were from to be drafted into the military. You know, <laughs> and I thought about that much later. I said, wow, there's a similarity to that. <laughs> and. Uh, <clears throat> so I started, a friend of mine, uh, let me see, how did that go? I started teaching at this high school, a marching band kind of thing. Uh, and the fall of that year, because, well, during the time I got the greetings and, and got the physical. Uh, the guy from the Marine Corps called me up about volunteering for the draft. And I thought about that. I said, man, I don't know about, about them guys, you know. <laughs> but I never heard from anybody, not the Army, the Air Force, and they, none of them. So after a while, because by this time I was, uh, what was I, 22, 23, something like about that age. And I said, man, I need to get this military thing behind me because I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do. <clears throat> the guy from the Marine Corps called me again and he said, I'll tell you what, you can volunteer for the draft, which really meant that instead of having to do three years, you can just do two years. So I says, okay, I'll just do two years in the Marine Corps and get that over with. Was there a concern about uh, going to Korea? About what? About going to, to uh, North Korea at that time? No, 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 not, okay. not at that time. Okay. Korea finished pretty much in 1953. Mm -hmm. So you're talking, was after that? See, I finished college in 1955. Oh, okay. So it was after Korea and before Vietnam. Yeah. So I understand you ended up playing in a, so in a group called the Dress Blues? The, the Core Four. That the was the Core name of the group. Four. Oh, okay. <laughs> and... Well, I went, I, I, I went 
into the Marine Corps, you know, went through the boot camp and the infantry training and all of that stuff. So when I was assigned, uh, I remember the, 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 the recruiter, once I decided that I was done, he says, yeah, man, well, you can go to Paris Island. I said, whoa, stop right there. I said, I am not going to Paris Island. <laughs> no, because I had heard about Paris yeah. Island. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, well, what about, you could go to MCRD, the Marine Corps Recruit Depot, which is in San Diego. I said, well, that sounds a little better, so I'll do that, you know. So that's what I did. And I went through the, the training, basic training there, and then in La Cañada, I think it's California, I think it's the name of it, it's nothing but hills. And we, it was after boot camp, but we went, and all we did was run up and down them hills, man, you know. So when, I, when my orders came, <clears throat> after I finished with the training, to give you a 10 day leave. And my orders came to report to El Toro. At the time, El Toro was an air base where fighter pilots trained. And there was a band there attached to that particular branch. Not branch. Uh, Division or? See, the, uh, the main station at El Toro was like stable, stationary. Like the people who were there, they were there to sort of run the base. The air wing was a part of what they call Air Pacific, which meant that the training was preparing Marines. If anything happened in the Pacific, these were the guys who were going to go first. But the base, if you were with, on the base with, uh, I don't know what it would be called, then you would, you would stay there. But the band was a part of Air Pacific, so if, if they went, then the band went with them, if it happened, you know. So I was in the Marine Band at El Toro, and the guy <laughs> came up to me one day, he was a sergeant, he said, hey man, how'd you like to be on TV? You know, and I'm looking at him saying, hey man, you know, that's a funny joke, right? He said, no, man. He said, the piano player, his enlistment was up. So we need a piano player in the group. So I said, yeah, okay, I'll go and audition for that. So I did. And I was accepted in to that group. It was four players. That's why I was called the core four, uh, guitar, string bass, drums, and piano. And that was, that's what I did. The show, the, the, the TV show lasted maybe about a year after I got on there, or a year and a half, something like that. So then the, the lieutenant who was in charge, he got this radio show which featured us Basically doing the same thing we did on the TV show, but it was on his radio show. And I did that until my enlistment was up. Nice. So that was pretty much what I did. All right. I'm going to fast forward a little bit. You came back to New Orleans and um, got married and started a family. Did the the fact that you started having kids and that whole family thing. Did that affect 
your choice of what you were going to do for a living in music? No, I had a high degree of immaturity. <laughs> <coughs> and at the same time, I had a fantastic wife who liked jazz and understood it. I mean, I would still work with, in my father's business. I see. You know, but eventually, uh, when I look back at it, see, things were beginning to change. and. And something that I notice when you are in the midst of whatever happens to be changing in your environment, or even even in the country, but in your particular environment, you don't see it. It takes a while to figure it out. You know, this club over here don't exist no more. This one over there, they got musicians playing a lot of guitars. You know, and, and eventually uh, you begin to try to figure out, well, now, you know, <laughs> what am I going to do? But I think working in my dad's business allowed me to pursue jazz because there were still some good musicians in the city. Um, Alvin Baptiste uh, became a school teacher which he eventually left and started at Southern University in Baton Rouge. He did that till he retired, and they brought him back to do the jazz group. Harold was teaching, but he left the school system, and at some point, I don't, I'm trying to remember. I, I don't know exactly what Harold did because during the time that he left the school system, I think I was in the military because mm -hmm. that was when he started a recording company called AFO. And, and there were people who thought that I was a part of that, but I was in the military when it got started, so I was not a, a part of AFO. The first jazz recording that I did with a quartet was on AFO label. Um, but that would have been 60 something, 60 ish, mm -hmm. early, early 60s. Yeah. About that same time, maybe 62 or so, I think you did something with two of my favorite musicians, and that is the Adderley Brothers? Yeah. <clears throat> there was a tennis saxophone player in the band <clears throat> named Nathaniel Paralot. And there was a drummer named James Black. Well, Cannon and Nat had heard about Nathaniel Paralot. So they came to New Orleans because they wanted to check him out. They didn't know about James Black, you know, but when they heard James Black, you know, they really wanted him to go in his band, but he didn't go for whatever his reasons were. But we did do a recording with uh, Sam Jones, Cannon and Nat and Nat Paralot, James Black and me, which was uh, a different recording session from what we did with AFO, with Harold. Cannonball had a reputation already at that time, didn't he? Hmm? Didn't Cannonball have a, a pretty good reputation at that time? Oh yeah, he had an excellent reputation because he had already gone to New York <clears throat> and as a result, when he came to New Orleans to do the recording, he came with Aaron Keep News, who was with Riverside, I That's think. That's right. You see, so Cannon, Cannon was pretty astute about the business of 
music, a lot more so than some real good jazz players were. And uh, I remember seeing them hosting a TV show. I don't know. Yes, from the West was, Coast. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if it was a, a substitute or what it was, but I mean, he was good at that. He had the gift of gab, didn't he? He did, but not just the gift of gab. See, Cannon had a way of expressing things which was always near uh, some aspect of humor, which is what people would relate to. You know, I mean, if you think about later, you know, when, when, when the, the talking heads, when Carson came uh, on NBC, uh, after, <coughs> oh, I, I can't think of his name, but anyway, he was pretty straight up and down. Right. He was good at what he did, but what he did was sort of getting to be out of old. So the, the whole aspect of humor was finding its way into that medium. Mm -hmm. And like Cannon, <coughs> Cannon had that, I don't know, um, I never knew anything about that TV show. I was surprised when I turned the TV on and saw, I don't even remember what network or any of that. No, I didn't know about it either and uh, Roy McCurdy told me about it. Yeah. Roy played with Cannon for a long time. So I want to go back to something you were talking about with uh, the scene was changing and the guitars started to come in. <coughs> were you um, enlisted or were you tempted to play rock and roll? If, if you listen to Chuck Berry, you know, we got Johnny Johnson a very important part of the group. So there was piano that could be done in rock and roll. Did you ever um, need to play in, in that sort of fashion? Oh yeah, I know how to play that. Yeah. Yeah, I could do that little Richard thing. <laughs> I mean, it was all a part of learning. You know, you learn how to play them shuffles behind them singers and the boogies and all of that. and. Because it wasn't, it wasn't a big thing, you know. It's not like, you know, you condescending to do anything. I mean, it was a part of an environment that you were a part of. And when you went to play, like, <clears throat> when, uh, when somebody called you on the phone and said, hey man, we need a piano player for tomorrow night. And when you went, you went expecting whatever it is that they wanted you to do within a certain, you know, um, I don't know, a coterie of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, there wasn't a wide variety. But it would be I remember Big Mama Thornton came to the do job and she called, I forget the name, it was a blues, I think. And she counted off and I started playing a shuffle. And she stopped. She said, no, uh-uh. No, I don't want that. Just straight ahead. So it was more jazz influence of what she wanted, you know, in terms of uh, what she was saying. She wanted straight eighth notes? Like, like Well, rock. she wanted, she, I, I don't know, she never expressed it in, in musical terms, mm -hmm. but what she wanted was us to do an element of swing which supported what she was doing. Okay. Not just, you know, not, not the shuffle. You know, so, but anyway, <clears throat> so I mean, it's like, it's like play what the situation calls for. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
What made you decide to uh, get into higher education? Was it something that just came along and you said, I can do this also? Uh, I guess in a way it came along, in a way. See, <clears throat> by the time uh, I started to teach as an adjunct at Xavier University, and I became real good friends with a visual artist named John T. Scott. So he and I would cook up these schemes of things that we thought that we could do at the university, like have students come in and for the entire year work as a team, the visual artist, the music, and the theater person on a project to present at the end of the school year. You know, and there were other things that we did, actually did beside that, but it was something that we thought that we could do. Uh, and John presented the idea to the, to the, there was a nun who was there to get grants for stuff. And he presented the idea to her. And she took it to, you know, whatever was given grants. We didn't get the grant, but somebody else got one and was doing the exact same thing that we were talking about. But anyway, I was as young as Xavier. And I had been teaching in a little town, Brobridge, for a couple of years as a band director. Because I, I really, the family had grown and I really needed a job. I preferred it to be in music and what I was doing. And at the end of the second year, I didn't really mesh too well with the superintendent. So I resigned. <clears throat> so when I went back to New Orleans, because while well, I had a chance to teach in the elementary school in Lafayette, Louisiana, which is much bigger than Brobridge. It's a town. And it was, it's a university town also. Because we had a group while I was living in Brobridge of band directors that we call the directors and then we would rehearse sometimes in my band room and it would, you know, from different parts of Louisiana. The drummer was from Mamou, uh, one saxophone player was from St. Martinville, another one a baritone player, he was, uh, where was he from? I forgot now, but they, they were nearby places. And the trumpet player who had been in Brobridge before I got there, he was in Opelousa. And uh, so we would play, you know, and just before I resigned, uh, the saxophone player who was, uh, uh, David Pipkin, he said, man, we would like for you to stay in the area. He said, I think you could get a job in Lafayette as an elementary school teacher, which means no more football games, <laughs> halftime shows, no more parades on Saturday, because man, there was a lot there. If you were a band teacher, especially in high school, there was the Yamboli Parade, the Crawfish Parade, the Strawberry Festival, <laughs> man, it was one after the next. But anyway, uh, I talk, I went and I talked to my wife. I said, look, because I know she didn't like the town anyway. You, you moved the whole family 
yeah. there for the job. She didn't like that town anyway, and I understood it, you know, because she was in a town in which everybody around her, they spoke Patois 24-7 all the time, and that was not her culture, mine either for that matter. They spoke what? Patois. That's like, they, some people say broken French, oh, okay. you know, but that's really what it's called, Patois. Mm -hmm. And uh, they may say Cajun French, mm -hmm. you know. The, the essence of, of that language is that it's not, it's very idiomatic, so to speak. For example, there are no tenses. Like, if, if it's French, <clears throat> um, and you want to make a statement, there will there's tenses, you know, like il, elle, like je, uh, and then and and the patois. If you wanted to say I have four, instead of like French may say. Uh, J Cartre. I am for. You know, they and and the Creole thing they just say Mon Gain Cart. <laughs> so it was that's why they sometimes they call it broken French, but it was a dialect. Yes. It was not written, it was a dialect. So after I talked to my wife, you know, she said, Man, I won't go home. So we packed up and went back to New Orleans. I was still working with my dad <clears throat> at his place and uh, got a call from the, uh, the straw boss in the Al Hurst band about joining his band. And that's what I did. How big was that band at that time? Uh, let me see, he had an organ player, a drummer. He was playing trumpet. He had a clarinet saxophone player and a saxophone player. Uh, it was five, I think. Mm -hmm. So he, he became a pretty well-known name. Did you get to play on his recordings, or did he have a separate recording band? I did, but the way it was recorded, the piano was insignificant. Mm -hmm. You know, we had, you know, I'd play whatever the part was. Right. You would never know who was playing piano because the arrangement basically featured Al and the band behind him. Right. What was that tune? Ba -ba -da 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 What was that? Uh, oh, Java? J Java, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah Alan Tucson wrote that. Oh. There's so many f f names that come out of New Orleans. Um, do you know wh what is it about this city? Maybe not now, but um, for all those decades that just fostered so much wonderful music. Well, I don't know how wonderful a lot of it was. Uh, It's, it's hard to pin down <clears throat> because there's so many rumors going around about how the music got started. But if you examine the early music, say, of uh, King Oliver and the group that Louis Armstrong was in, as well, as a Louis Armstrong group, you know, the Hot Five and the Hot Seven, the major influence musically was John Philip Sousa. The instrumentation, you know, you had a trumpet, the clarinet on the high parts, the trombone, and the tuba playing the bass. And you had a bass drummer and a snare drummer. And the drummers, instead of playing the military 
rudimental approach to music, they would play with accents that suggested a dance or strut. Uh, not exactly when that started, I don't know. You know, but if there's some pieces that you can trace directly to a march, like there's a clarinet solo that I think Alphonse Pico was credited with playing in high society. And when you listen to that, it sounds like the uh, Sousa March. So, <clears throat> I played a job once, much later than that, at a club, no, it wasn't a club, it was a hall with Papa Albert French. And the whole night, all we played was waltzes. Yeah. I take it people were dancing then. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but and that was basically, man, what we did, play waltzes. Mm -hmm. And I had never played a, a job like that. But that, <clears throat> I think that that was an influence, at least in part, of the French that came into yeah. New Orleans. Mm -hmm. I think, anyway, you yeah, know. The quadrilles and some of that music that came over yeah. New Orleans. Did you get in on any of the uh, recording work that happened, some of the, a couple of the studios in New Orleans? Like recording sessions, you know, just get a call to come and down and... Very few, most of the rhythm and blues sessions were done, uh, the biggest studio was probably Alan Toussaint's studio at, at Sea Saint. And Alan was the piano player. And there were sessions where he would call somebody, uh, like Eddie Bo, who was a piano player. And then there was James Booker. He would get James Booker, and he was also a piano player. So I was never called to do any of that. Uh, I remember talking to Dave Bartholomew one time. I said, man, look, I need a gig. He said, oh, man, get over. you don't need no job, man. Well, see, he was thinking about the success of my father's business and me working with him. You know, and that I didn't have none of that in mind. You wanted a music job. You know, but uh, that was basically it. I wanted to ask you about, um, I, I asked you early on about music when you were a kid in your house. Then I started about thinking about uh, your own household with your own kids. I know my, f my father used to walk into my room if I was playing uh, John Coltrane or something and he would be totally mystified by what was going on. And I wonder if your kids, when they were growing up, were playing music that you didn't dig, and what would you, what were your, was your reaction to it? You mean with their peers? Yes. No, I liked all of that. <clears throat> you know, because they would play Earth, Wind, and Fire. They would play Flashback. Um, some of the groups I don't remember right now, but. See, when I started to teach at NOCA, the first thing that I found out was that the kids in high school that were still in high school anyway, they cared nothing about jazz at all. So if I was going to be successful, I'd have to meet them where they were. So I had pl already played the popular music of my day. So. 
then I started to understand where they were coming from in terms of the music that they were playing. And uh, so my, the two older boys, Branford and Winton, they joined a band <clears throat> called The Creators, and they were playing the popular music of the day, which I was uh, reasonably familiar with. You know, it wasn't foreign to me. And uh, I remember <laughs> one of them told me that uh, I didn't really go to a lot of their jobs, but I went to one and I sat in and the other guys in the band, <laughs> they didn't know what to expect. So when I played with them, played the piece, you know, they were totally surprised that I could do that. I don't remember which piece it was, you know, but uh, I used everything that, any and everything that I could to reach out to the kids who was coming in. Mm -hmm. That's a healthy way to teach. And I wonder if your kids asked advice of you. I mean, they must have learned r really early on what it meant to play a gig, even when, you know, before they played any instruments. Dad's going to another gig. And later on, when they were making their career, did they ask you for advice about making certain decisions? Not that I remember. <laughs> None that I remember. Well, it's... Um, it's very interesting to see what they've done. And you must read, you know, they, uh, all of them have been praised. And then, of course, there's always, um, especially if you're in a powerful position, some people are going to criticize the way you do things. I wonder if you read things about your own kids that aggravate you, about from critics and so forth. No. Uh, I don't think the critics even pay attention today. They don't bother with that. They don't. They. I'm pretty sure they don't review Renton Hall at all. And even if they did, you know, I don't know that they would really understand. You know, he just sent me some music that he did, which was commissioned by the Berlin Philharmonic. You know, which he calls like uh, a swing symphony, which includes the Berlin Philharmonic and the Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra, which is through composed. Well, I said through composed. I I haven't gone through the score. Some of it, I think, is improvised, but for the most part, it was all written. And he's finished another piece without the jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra. That's totally just for the symphony orchestra. He composed the violin concerto, which uh, Nicky Benedetti <coughs> has been concertizing. Wow. You know. So, I mean, and I've never seen any reviews or any or anything. Hmm. I mean, even if they would say it was lousy, it would be like somebody. <laughs> As Miles Davis one time, he said, man, this guy, this critic was putting you down and all of this and, and blah, blah, what do you think of that? He said, did he spell my name right? <laughs> you know, so sometimes being on, being on the right side of a moral issue, there is no bad publicity. Excellent. I think it's terrific that you've got to record with them. Um, and speaking of having people write about you, this is someone's opinion in a you know, C CD guide to jazz book. And this is what they said about your piano playing. Ellis Marcellus was influenced at first by Bud Powell, but by the 1960s he adopted a percussive melodic style filled with blues-based figures and was using left-hand voicings typical of later bop players. 
I was really not influenced by Bud at all. I became more aware of Bud later when uh, when I really started to listen at Bud. But I was really not influenced by Bud Powell at all. My first major influence was Oscar Peterson. Good place to start. W were you a record uh, LP buyer? Did you buy a lot of records over the years? I did. My mom thought I was crazy. <laughs> 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 I used to buy a lot of records. I ended up with a total of oh, 376 long playing records, which I eventually uh, gave to the public library. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which, I, you know, they're probably still over there. <laughs> What's, uh, I don't know how exactly how to ask this question, but what's the most progressive music in jazz that, that you liked? I was thinking of Kid Jordan. He called himself the last free man in, in New Orleans. And I wonder, so I'm going to change my question a little bit. Did you ever participate in what we might call free jazz? <laughs> I think I did <laughs> once in, on, in, in, on a live concert. It was an uh, alto saxophone player who came through New Orleans and I was in the rhythm section and uh, man, what's his name? I did, he's still on the faculty at Oberlin now. Wasn't uh, Roscoe Mitchell? Roscoe Mitchell, perhaps? No, okay. no, no, no. Uh, anyway, he, when he came on the bandstand, you know, he said, well, what it is, fellas, he said, that everything is going to be like totally free. I said, yeah, okay. So we played totally free for a couple of hours. And at the end of it, while I was waiting for him, he was going to see about the business. I just started playing this Fats Waller tune, Jitterbug Waltz. And he said, hey man, if I had known that you knew how to play that, we could have played it. <laughs> Yeah, he you know, should have asked. <laughs> there is one recorded example of me doing what might be called free jazz, and that was with Eddie Harris. You know, it's, it's called Homecoming. It's a duo, just the two of us. And part of that recording, there's a section of it which is kind of free. Mm -hmm. And there were, there were some people <laughs> who had heard and said, man, I didn't know he could play like that. <laughs> You're always surprising people. <laughs> First your sons, and then, uh, have you ever, uh, this is also a, a, sometimes a tough question. Do you remember a musical train wreck on a gig, like a gig that was just, for one reason or another, a musical train wreck? A mu what? See? Well, I mean like, um, you get on a gig and for one reason or another the thing's just going awful. Can you remember the terrible gig that you've played in the past? You know, I don't know. I don't really know. I don't remember that. I don't remember anything like that. Well, that's, that's good then. Because they're not fun, right? <laughs> I, don't, I really don't remember. No, I really don't. I don't remember anything like that. All right. How about the best gig you ever played? Oh, I don't know. Uh, let's see. I think the most interesting job that I have ever played, it was really at the Kennedy Center, and there was a like a trad gig. 
I was playing piano and Louis Barbaran was playing drums. Louis Cottrell was playing clarinet. Alvin Alcorn was playing trumpet and Al Waldron Frog Joseph was playing trombone. And we were doing, you know, like Sensation Rag, uh, you know, the, the traditional music. And it was, it was the first time that I can remember being able to really play on a good piano with the older guys, because I never spent a lot of time. I, would, I had played individually, like I had played with Alvin Alcorn for a couple of jobs. But I had never actually played with a whole group of trail musicians, you know. And that was a very interesting gig because the first thing that I realized was the polish that they played with, man. Like they, were, they played soft, you know, it wasn't a lot of loud stuff. And like they were all excellent <laughs> musicians. You know, and that was one of the fondest memories that I have of, of, of playing a gig. There have been other examples. Not long ago, I was playing at Snug Harbor, and Jason happened to be in, in town because he's not always there and he was playing drums on the gig. And Branford shows up, and he had his horn, and we started playing, uh, you know, kind of up-tempo tune. And like, I just strolled on a lot of that. Because he, Branford and Jason, got into the saxophone drum thing, and it took me back to Elvin and Tran, because I mean, it was memorable, you know, because I mean, they were like firing. Uh, <clears throat> that's a rarity because they, again, to, for all of, even when we did a family game, we did a tour once. Uh, I forget the year. We did a family tour. But we never played anything like that. I mean, we, put, we played with pretty well mapped out and planned so that, you know, we could really perform like together. Mm -hmm. It was little, no freelancing. No freelancing. The one thing that was surprising me when we did that family tour Again, I think we were playing at Kennedy Center that Winton and Jason did uh, Donna Lee, that piece by Charlie Parker, and Winton was playing and Jason was whistling. And he whistled that chart along with Winton playing. And before I heard them do that, I didn't even know that they could do that. <laughs> and I'm, you know, I was it was probably the one's idea, you know. But when it comes down to it, I don't know. It's hard for me to remember any one gig that would be considered the best. Because I look backwards for things for which I was either learning something or teaching something. Like I, I did learn one thing. There was a, a club owner on Frenchman Street. I had uh, Victor Goins was playing tenor and Noel Kendricks and Reginald Veal was playing bass. You know, it was all these young cats. So we got off the bandstand and the, the club owner said, man, the 
customers say they wish you would play more. And my first re reaction was content, you know, like like I thought they meant I wish you would play more than you was playing. But the, when I thought about it, what I was doing for the paying customer was to invoke the classroom on the bandstand. I would play a tune, I'd play one chorus, and then I'd sit there and I'd listen at Victor, I'd listen at the drummer and the bass player. Unmindful of the fact that these people, man, they ain't come in for that. They're not paying the freight for me to be, and it's not that they couldn't play, it's that not that. You know, I mean, Victor's with Jazz and Lincoln Center Band now. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> that was the first time that I realized that I had been doing something like that. You know, and uh, I had been mindful of that ever since. Oh, it's always something to learn. Hmm? There's always something to learn. Yeah. It usually happens on a gig. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, just to wrap up here, if um, let's suppose we went down in the lobby and we sat down for a cup of coffee and one of the hundreds of young musicians that are here at this convention happened to join us and said, Mr. Marcellus, I really want to make a career in jazz. Do you have one piece of advice for me? Only if he has to. Mm. I borrowed that phrase from, <laughs> there was a show on TV which uh, featured actors. I can't remember the host's name. And it was like a class and the, and the actor would, would, the guest would come on and he'd talk about his career to a class of would-be actors. And at one point, one of the people, that, one of the students said, uh, I'm really like acting. And I was wondering, you know, do you think I should continue being an actor? And that's what he told him. He said, only if you have to. And it's a strange way, not everybody would really understand that, <laughs> you know. But I realized that that was how, pretty much how I lived my life. That was something that I had to do. It wasn't about, well, man, you got five sons, six sons, one who's autistic, who's still living with me now, and, you know, all these miles to feed. <laughs> How you gonna do that? But I, I, I never developed a defeatist attitude about it. I always figured that somehow it would work out. I mean, I just believe that. Now, that can be very naive. In some cases, it might be very stupid. I don't know. But I really believe that somehow it was going to work out. And it looks like it did to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, how at my age, if it didn't, it's too late to worry about it now. <laughs> well, Ellis Marcellus, thank you very much for your time today. You're welcome. I really enjoyed talking with you. And um, I hope we cross paths again soon. <laughs>